Good morning, beautiful listeners, and thank you for making time for your gentle, passive English learning. On Simple English Listening, we speak about different, exciting topics, but in simpler, pre-intermediate English. I mean, it gets boring, right? Always listening to new grammar and new rules. How about we have no rules for 25 minutes? Why not learn about other things, other wonderful topics, and about the wider world, but also improve your English at the same time? Here, we use the comprehensible input method. This means that you listen to and read. Listen to and read as much English as possible that is just one level above your level. Just one level above yours. Listen to and read English that you mostly understand. What's important here is that you mostly understand what I'm saying. This way, you will naturally pick up new language. And just as importantly, you will review and see old words that you already know. You'll review these old words, but see them in hundreds and hundreds of new ways using different contexts. Contexts means in different ways. Experiencing the same word, but used in many, many different ways is how you learn how and when to use a word and exactly what it means. Today, Today, we will talk about the largest city in Europe, an epic city, a city of many magical and mysterious stories and legends and histories, Constantinople, aka, aka means otherwise known as, aka Istanbul. This is a city of over 20 million people, depending on how you count them, and it is loud. It is hectic. It's busy. There's so much traffic. But there's beauty. Beauty to the chaos. Oh yeah, guess what? It is now possible to rate this podcast on Spotify. I only noticed a few days ago. If you could please give us a, a star rating out of five, that would mean so much to me. I don't make any money from this. Uh, this podcast is a labor of love to help you learn English. It's my hobby. A five-star rating really helps this podcast get to more people, which gives me, to be honest, immense joy and a sense of reward that more people can benefit from my efforts. So Istanbul was once the seat of many great empires, big and powerful empires. You know the Roman Empire of the ancient Romans, emperors such as Julius Caesar, Marcus Aurelius, and all of these cats. The Roman Empire was so big, so big that they had to split it into two. The Roman Empire was split into two parts, the Western Roman Empire on one side and the Eastern Roman Empire on the other side and each of them had their own emperors. Rome was the capital of the western one in Italy. And Istanbul, or back then Constantinople, the old name for it, was the capital of the eastern one. Back then, of course, Istanbul was called Constantinople, named after the emperor. It's a cool name, isn't it? It's fun to say. Constantinople, the old name for Istanbul. What actually happened is, after Rome was finally destroyed and sacked, and the Western Roman Empire ended, the Eastern one continued for about a millennia. A millennia is another noun, another noun for a thousand years. A millennia, a millennia. It continued for a a millennia longer than the Western one. But then, but then, a new group of people called the Ottomans came from central Turkey. They wanted to take 
Constantinople to add to their land. After an awesome battle, digging tunnels, tunnels under the ground, and people sneaking into these tunnels, and also using the biggest guns and biggest cannons ever made worldwide up to that time. The Ottomans invaded, they took Constantinople in 1453, and they ended the Eastern Roman Empire for good. Islam became the religion you could still be a Christian or Jew if you paid a kind of tax called uh, the uh, jizya tax, I believe it's called. And also you couldn't join the army or the military. The name of the city after the invasion was changed to, as we know it today, Istanbul. Istanbul means to the city in Greek. And it was a very multicultural city. Languages you'd hear in the city. Languages in the city were Greek, Turkish, Arabic, Bulgarian, Persian, Albanian, Serbian. And once again, the city flourished. And they say it went into a golden age, becoming a center of trade. They'd send coffee, coffee to Western Europe and still to this day. Istanbul has a proud, famous coffee culture. Ah, it's very strong. Very strong, but it looks beautiful, at least. The cups, the kettle, etc. It's very artistic. I love it. Istanbul was a center of art, architecture and crafts. A true multicultural metropolis. Istanbul became the royal city of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire that stretched all across the Middle East as far as Baghdad in Iraq and Baku in Azerbaijan. All across northern Africa from Egypt to Algeria and up, up, up to Austria and Hungary and the middle of Europe, across Greece and up to Italy. It's a very big empire. The Ottoman Empire became the most powerful empire in the world. How did it end? One by one, countries left. Greece became independent in 1830. Then, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria in 1878. And it finally, in World War I, was the end of the Ottoman Empire. In World War I, the Ottoman Empire was on the same side as Germany. Germany, the, the bad guys. So, so we get taught at school. Of course, World War I is more complicated than World War II. But anyways, after the Ottoman Empire and Germany lost World War I, the USA, the UK and France, etc. split up, separated the empire into the smaller countries that we have today. In Istanbul, you can still see the palace today, the palace of the Sultan. The Sultan, the Sultan ruled the Ottoman Empire, had absolute 100% power for most of it. Sultan is another word for emperor. In the Sultan's palace today, you can see historic artifacts, Historic artifacts are things from history, from the, the prophets. Uh, there they have a, a small piece of Prophet Muhammad's beard and his tooth and a, a footprint and some other things. By the way, his footprint was extremely big and wide. You can see it for yourself. Maybe he was quite a heavy guy. All the footprint is fake. Who knows? Also, there's the cane, the staff, the walking stick of Prophet Moses, and also things that belong to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jesus, and some other biblical characters. There's also a whole room of clocks, clocks everywhere on every wall, clocks of all different shapes and sizes and materials, the swords and the armor and the shields, 
were very impressive. The most royal, regal, majestic I've ever seen. Swords and shields and armor all covered in gold and jewels and rubies. But the most amazing thing, the most amazing thing I saw in the palace was the, let's say, the culture of procreation. Procreation means of having children, of having offspring. So they did it very differently to how many people do it today. Basically, what happened was that there was one part of the palace that they'd fill with hundreds and hundreds of young virgin girls from around the empire. When the sultan felt horny, basically, when he felt horny, meaning when he had sexual needs, he'd walk into this giant building full of hundreds of the most beautiful girls of all the empire. If you were one of these girls, if you were one of these girls, the, the greatest thing at the time that could happen to you is to have one of the sultan's children. If you have one of the sultan's children, you would get beautiful accommodation. You would rise up the positions and become a more senior girl, more powerful and manage the other girls. If you, if you became a mother of one of the sultan's children, you were set, you were sorted. You'd have a more wealthier and luxurious life. But if, well, if you were the mother of the crown prince, if you were the mother of the firstborn child of the sultan, of the future sultan, oh my God, uh, you would have won the lottery. Back then, of course, I'm sure these, these girls would prefer the opportunities in today's day and age. If they had a time machine, of course, travel in time. It's, uh, but life seemed quite hopeless back then, right? But if you, out of thousands of girls, gave the sultan his firstborn child, you, you had won the lottery. The Lotteria. The mother of the crown prince became the queen mother and was the most powerful woman in all the Ottoman Empire and the center of power amongst all the girls. Also, she had lots of influence over the sultan and his decision making. And every morning, the sultan would tell the queen mother of the state affairs and the national news and get her opinion on things. Therefore, therefore, I don't know, but I imagine that when the sultan walks into the building with all the girls in it, they all run towards him, screaming, ripping his clothes off, pulling his pants down, desperate to have one of his children to escape the poverty. Many of them were captured from around the world as prisoners or as slaves, so their situation would have been very desperate. Essentially, the most attractive women and beautiful women from around the whole empire was there. Many of these girls were freed once they got to the age of 16 or 17, which back then was quite old, it seems, so they say. They were freed or married off to other high-ranking men in the Ottoman government or the friends of the sultan. Another weird, strange part of this lifestyle were the guards, the security of the harem. Harem. The harem is the area of the palace with all the girls. The guards were eunuchs. Eunuchs. A eunuch is a male who has had his sexual organs, his penis and balls, removed, cut off. They were mostly from Africa and either captured or purchased as slaves. Yeah? So people who were not free, it was not their choice. It's very sad. For their whole lives, these eunuchs had to protect the girls and protect the queen mother, but also protect the sultan's family. They did apparently receive a wage, a salary, a payment, but the highest currency in life, of course, is freedom. The highest currency of freedom and your own time is something sadly only a few of them experienced. 
they were the eunuchs were very rarely freed. Next, that's enough history. Let's talk about the food. The food in Turkey is obviously legendary. It's so delicious. It's mostly different kinds of kebabs and flame-grilled meats with different breads. Actually, it's kind of similar to what you find in other parts of the old Ottoman Empire, like in Greece. So maybe that they have that in common from their shared history. Of course, you always get the classic side dish. I don't know if you know the side dish. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's something like Esme or like Antep Esme. If you have acid problems in your stomach, like acid reflux, I, I can't think of anything worse. It is a side dish of mixed cold tomatoes, cold onions, peppers, and garlic, which are all the very worst things for acid reflux. And I have acid reflux, and still, I ate it. I ate it. I, because I couldn't resist. I couldn't say no. I couldn't resist. Goodness me, the food, and it was so cheap. Why was it so cheap? Actually, this is a, wow, it's a bit sad and depressing, but the reason it's so cheap, and also in Northern Cyprus, is because the Turkish currency, the Turkish money, the Turkish currency, the Turkish lira, is being destroyed. It is losing all of its value. The current inflation levels are 70% for this year. So whatever a Turkish lira is worth today, next year it will be 70% less. And that's just for this year. And they've had similar inflation problems for the last couple of years, actually. This is why everyone in Turkey, or many people in Turkey, they turn their money into euros, into dollars, gold, bitcoin. Because if they stay in Turkish lira, kapoof, it disappears. I spoke with a waiter at the restaurant and he says people working service and at lower level jobs, they barely have enough to live off of and everything in their salary just disappears. But, but, it's still a, it's a good time to go on holiday there, right? If you do not get paid in Turkish lira, and if you're from a foreign country, now is a cheap time. In Istanbul, there are many shops that sell dollars, sell euros, sell gold, because people want a different way to keep their money safe, to keep the value of their money. I met a local girl from Istanbul there, and she took me to this super interesting and completely unique neighborhood called Balat. If you're from Istanbul, I'm sure you know Balat. It's very unique, eh? Very cool. Balat, it was super colorful and pretty. There were many antique shops selling old furniture, clocks, musical instruments, and old music records. And some really artsy cafes with hipsters and, you know, cool people everywhere. Very trendy, very hip, very cool. But interestingly, she said it's also the heart of, the, as in the main center of the extremists, the radical Islam sect. Of course, there's many different kinds of, right, uh, Christians, Muslims, but these ones were the... Uh, the extremist jihad sect that believe in that. Very interesting. In Istanbul. So amongst the colorful cafes, you'll, for example, see two women walking quickly across the road, away from you, completely dressed in black, their faces covered head to toe, walking quickly. And I saw two angry, angry looking men angrily looking at me across the road, making eye contact with me with really, really baggy clothes and big beards. Or maybe my imagination was going wild. But it was, uh, yeah, it was exciting. It was cool. Anyways, also, you cannot go to Balat at night, apparently. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I was told that it's quite a dangerous place at night. There are many 
drug addicts, people who are high on drugs, off their face, and trying to get money from you, trying to rob you. I saw quite a few police cars driving around those streets while I was there. Actually, lots of police cars. Again, it was a bit, it was exciting, eh? Not many tourists go there, right? I really appreciated her taking me there uh, to see something completely unique and like an Istanbul experience that only the locals normally enjoy. Uh, I mean, in Istanbul, some of the most beautiful buildings are these legendary mosques, like next level mosques in terms of the architecture, the design, the beauty, especially the blue mosque, which is the, the mosque on the thumbnail on the picture of this podcast is the blue mosque and the Hagia Sophia mosque. These mosques were epic. A mosque, a uh, mosque mosque is where Muslims worship and pray. You say for a church for Christians, a uh, temple or pagoda for Buddhists and for Jews, we say a synagogue. There's a new vocabulary for you. Mosque, church, temple, pagoda, synagogue for the Jews. Synagogue is the most difficult one to say. Uh, but it's also the most fun one to say, synagogue. Anyway, in many of these mosques used to be churches and cathedrals if they're old enough. Because, of course, Istanbul used to be Christian when it was the Eastern Roman Empire, when it was called Constantinople. But when the Ottomans invaded about 500 years ago, the city became Islam. So... But, I mean, today you can definitely see many different religions and cultures there, all living together. It's quite a uh, secular society. To be honest, my favourite thing was to just walk around. I would have really long walks. Sometimes I'd just walk around for two, three hours. And to be honest, that's my favourite way to see a new city, to walk around and to people watch. I loved Istanbul to visit, but I don't think I could live there. It's a bit too... I mean, I was in the central part, so you have to understand, I was in the central part where staying where, where the tourists stay, right? And around there, it was just so busy and chaotic and hectic. There's just traffic jams of cars all throughout the day as if there was no separation between rush hour and, uh, you know, while people are at work. Now I'm a bit older, like an older gentleman. I feel like I prefer the simple life nowadays in smaller towns. So my trip to Istanbul was about, about five months ago. Uh, I've been in Cambodia since then, in beautiful Cambodia. And I'll tell you all about Cambodia, maybe in uh, two or three months. Next week, next next month, we'll do a uh, an interview with my friend about learning English, or I'll tell you about great things to practice your reading skills in English. So we'll try and do like a non-English topic, English topic, non-English topic, English, and kind of switch them around a bit. Okay, so as I said, if you could give a rating on Spotify, now that's possible, I would so appreciate that very exciting. I feel excited. I can finally uh, bring a bigger audience to my podcast, finally. Okay, thank you so much for your time, my friends, and uh, well done for being here. Well done for working on your English skills, uh, being productive, finding more opportunity, and trying to improve your life. Well done, guys. Uh, I'll see you next episode, okay? Uh, peace, love, and uh, all the rest, and take care of yourselves, okay?